as we approach 100 vlogs on this channel, we've been to quite a few places, but there's still a few legendary ones to check off the list. And today's stop is definitely one of those. That's right, we're at the Rio, home of the World Series of Poker for as long as I've been alive, I think. But rumor has it that it's actually the last time the World Series will be held here. It's moving over to Bally's, I believe. Not confirmed, but just something I heard from a few different people. Anyway, that's not why I'm here today. Somewhere in all that tournament chaos is a section for cash games, and it looks like they've got a 510 ready to start up. So that's what your boy is going to be jumping into and of course sharing all the interesting hands with you guys. So far on the trip, I've booked two winning sessions on the vlog. Maybe today we could do three in a row, who knows. But uh, anyway, that's it for now. Enough of the talk. Let's get inside and play some cards. All right, everyone, here we go. This game started as a 510, but as you guys can see from the title, that did not last. One cool thing about the Rio is that they have no max buy-in for 510, so things can get a little out of hand. Anyway, I buy in for $5,000 and we start off with 10-7 of spades in the straddle. Everyone folds to the big blind who completes the additional 10 before I raise to 80. He calls again and we go to a flop of 943 rainbow with one spade. He checks, I bet 50, and he makes the call. Things get interesting on the turn when we pick up a flush draw but face a lead from the big blind for $250. This bet doesn't make a ton of sense to me so I'm thinking he probably doesn't have a strong hand. Either way, my options here are to call and try to make a flush or put in a raise and represent an over pair. That second option sounds a lot more fun to me so I make it $750 to go now. My opponent isn't phased though as he makes the call and we go to the ace of diamonds on the river. This time he checks it over to me and well if I had an over pair on the turn I would still bet this river anyway since it's pretty much a brick so I guess it's time to die with the lie. I fire one last bet this time for $1200 and after some deliberation the big blind decides to fold. Later on there's an early position open to 35. Middle position calls and I look down at ace 10 of diamonds in late position. Could go either way between calling and raising. This time I decide to raise it up to 150. Original raiser calls and so does the player behind him. So three ways to the perfect flop. Jack 9-4 all diamonds. Checks to me. I have a pretty good hand so I bet. And only the initial raiser calls. Turns a break thankfully so when he checks I'm just going to continue putting chips in the pot. This time $450. Now, as if this hand wasn't enjoyable enough already, my opponent announces a raise, making it $1,400 to go. This raise leaves him with only around $1,200 behind, so I think moving all in is fine, but I decide to call just in case he's bluffing. Fingers crossed for a clean river, and that's exactly what we get, the deuce of spades. My opponent quickly announces all in, I just say call and turn it over, not really interested in making anyone show the losing hand. And yeah, we take down a sizable pot. Not very often you get raised when holding the nuts, but always a great feeling. In the next hand, I'm in the $20 straddle once again. Action folds all the way to the big blind who makes it $100. He could be doing this with all sorts of hands, just trying to take down my straddle, so ace-9 is definitely a hand to defend with. We go to a flop of 10-10-3 with two clubs, on which he continues with a $65 bet. I would expect him to do this with all his hands that raised pre-flop, so I make the call and find a 9 on the turn. There's a chance we had the best hand anyway, but now it just became even more likely. Big Blind disagrees though and bets again, this time for $200. Can't do anything besides call. River comes the 7 of diamonds and, much to my surprise, he fires again for $650 this time. Pretty interesting river spot now. 
On one hand, why would he continue betting when I could easily have a 10 or even a full house? Wouldn't all his overpairs check at some point? On the other hand, though, how often are people bluffing after betting all three streets? You don't really see that a lot. In the end, though, when people are representing almost no credible hands and I think they're capable of bluffing, I almost always lean towards a call, and this time was no different. However, my opponent turns over 10-8, and there you have it. No bluff. Population tendency strikes again. Moving along, in this next one, the straddle is on once again, and we finally get dealt a premium, pocket queens in the big blind. There's a middle position open to 75, and then two people call behind him before it gets to me. Quite the ideal situation since a raise here could appear like I'm just trying to squeeze and steal the pot. So I make it 475, and now the straddler goes in the tank. Perhaps he's thinking that I'm just making a move because he now raises himself to 1,075. Action folds all the way back to me, and we got a decision between calling or just getting it all in. He's only got around 1,800 behind at this point, so either seems fine to me. With the straddle on, it's only like 150 big blinds. Tournament players, cover your ears, I know. Anyway, I'm out of position, so I decided to just rip it in for 2,800 total. If he's got aces or kings, so be it. That's just how poker goes sometimes. He calls and announces ace-king, but then when I show, he flips over aces. I guess I must have misheard, but anyway, he asked to run it twice. I'm happy to let people pick what they want, so two boards it is. Unfortunately, we miss on both boards and end up giving back all the profit from the night so far. Nothing to do but keep at it though, this time with 9-8 suited in the big blind. Action folds all the way to me, I race to 60, and the straddler calls. Flop's a good one, ace-8-8 eight, eight with the flush draw. I bet small, and he calls. Turn's not so good though, the king of diamonds. Still, we should keep betting with a hand this strong though, so I make it 180 this time, and once again he makes the call. River is bad to worse, the four of diamonds and the fourth diamond. This time I check since I don't have one of those, and as I'm contemplating if this hand is a good candidate to check raise, my opponent just checks back. I show, and he mucks. Now at this point in the night, everyone at the table agrees to convert from 510 to 102550. Quite the jump in stakes, so I add another 10,000 and prepare for battle. In the following hand, we're five-handed, so I open king five suited to 150 in late position, and get called by the button and the straddler. Three of us to a flop, which comes down 8-6-3 with one diamond. We have some backdoor flush and straight possibilities, so when the straddler checks, I continue with a $175 bet, trying to either get it heads up or just take it down on the flop. However, both of these guys make the call, so I'm pretty much done with it until the king of spades appears on the turn. Now, things get a little dicey when the straddler suddenly leads out and quite sizable too, $875. Already not a very fun situation as he's leading into two players, but can't turn top pair and just fold to a single bet, so I make the call and the button folds behind me. River looks good, the six of hearts, and now the straddler checks it. I'm not really sure if we can expect to get called by a worse hand here, so I just check it back. He announces an eight, I show my hand, and we win. Kind of frustrating that he had something we could have gotten value from, but to be honest, I didn't really put him on an 8 after calling the flop and then leading when the king comes out. So whatever, I'm happy to take it. Later on, I open jack 10 on the button and get called just by the big blind. Flop comes 8-7-5, not really a board that's going to hit me super often, so when he checks, I just check it back. Turn card, however, changes things. The 9 of hearts, improving us to the absolute best possible hand out of nowhere. As if that wasn't cool enough, my opponent now leads for 325. Now, raising here would be really hard to ever balance with bluffs, but against this particular player, I wasn't really concerned with that, so instead, I go for the most embarrassing play in the book. The min raise. Doesn't look strong at all, right? At least my opponent doesn't think so because he announces all in for 2,000 total. I immediately just turn it over and call. The river is a deuce, and we win against queen 10. In the next one, I open eights from early position and get raised by the player on my left to 475. Being that we're both in early position, I suspect this is probably a strong hand, so when it gets back to me, I just call in hopes of a good flop, and I would say 8-3 deuce definitely qualifies. 
I check, and my opponent continues the aggression with a $325 bet. He started the hand with around 11 or 12k, so with that much left to play for, I'm certainly going for a raise. I make it 1400 to go, and after giving it some thought, he makes the call. Turn isn't great though, the Ace of Clubs. This card doesn't do much for us unless he somehow called the flop with Ace-King. What's more likely though is that we're now losing action from big pairs like Kings, Queens, Jacks, and not just because there's an overcard, but also 5-4 suited improves to a straight. With all that in mind, I think the best play here is to bet really small or just check in hopes that he bets again. This guy in particular had been overly aggressive, so I decided to check, but he ends up checking back. River is the four of hearts, so now any five makes a straight. Pretty unlikely either of us has one though. At this point, I think the best play is to just bet big and target his hands with showdown value like those big pairs or any ace he might have. Plus, if I had any bluffs here like Miss Spades for example, I'd play those hands the same way. So I fire for about the size of the pot, $4,000. Now my opponent goes deep into thought before eventually deciding on a fold. Would have loved to see a bigger pot, obviously, but I think that turn card is probably to blame. Not long after that one, I get involved in another interesting spot with pocket queens. There's an open from middle position to 150. I make it 600 on the button, and now the big blind makes it 1600 off of a 6k stack. Initial razor folds, and it's back on me. In this situation, shoving for 6000 seems like a bit of an overplay. Folding seems way too tight, so that just leaves one option. I call the extra thousand and we go to a 994 flop with a flush draw. He continues with a small bet and I make the call. Turn is interesting, the deuce of spades. He checks and the reason I say this card is interesting is because I would expect him to check almost all his hands here. So just because he slows down doesn't really give me any additional confidence about having the best hand. So I decide to check it back and we see a brick on the river, the five of hearts. Now when he checks though, I'm fairly certain we have the best hand because if he had aces, kings, or a flush, he probably would have value bet the river. So when he checks, I think he's more weighted towards ace high, maybe jacks or tens. So now the question becomes, if I shove all in, what's more likely, that we get called by a smaller pocket pair or that we get called by a cautiously played aces or kings? To be honest, I'm not super sure, but I would hate to check back here and get shown jacks. So I decided to just rip it in for around 3,000. I don't really hate the play, but I'm not sure I love it either. Doesn't seem to make much difference though as my opponent quickly folds. In the next hand, yours truly is in the $100 double straddle. There's an early position open to 325. Then it folds to me looking down at queen 10 of hearts. I make the call and we flop top pair on 10, 6, 4. I check and he checks it back. Turn is the nine of spades. I decide to check again, although I certainly don't mind a bet either. Now he fires for 300. This would be a pretty good board to start a bluff on, but seeing as we have top pair, I'm not really sure it's necessary. So I just call and we see the six of clubs on the river. I check again, and once again he fires, this time for 1125. Kind of a tough spot to be honest. On one hand, it seems like a straightforward call given how passively I played my hand, but on the other, it seems really unlikely that he's bluffing this river card since any hand that called on the turn is probably not folding now. I don't know, it's pretty close. But by now, you guys probably already know, if it's close, chips are going in the pot. Turns out, he also has queen 10. So, yeah, he wasn't bluffing, but we don't lose the pot. Fine with me, I guess. You know what's easier to play than a weak top pair, though? Pocket aces. And that's what we've got here, on the button of all places. I open it up to 150 and get called just by the straddler. Heads up to a flop of 7 deuce deuce with a flush draw. He checks, I bet 100, and he calls. Turn is the five of clubs, looks innocent to me, so when he checks again, I'm just gonna keep betting. This time I size up to $750, and once again, my opponent makes the call. Sizable pot brewing here, as we're off to see one last card, which comes the seven of spades. Straddler checks for a third time, and now we've got a decision between betting or checking back in case he has a full house. After thinking about it for a bit, I decide a bet is definitely the play, and the reason why is because I could have some bluffs here like missed hearts or small suited aces. As such, I should probably also be betting hands for value and pocket aces definitely fit that bill. So I fire one last time, this time for $2,300. My opponent instantly looks uncomfortable, which is nice because we can mostly dismiss getting check raised now, unless he's doing some Leonardo DiCaprio impression. 
Anyway, after thinking it over for a few minutes, he finally decides on a call. I show, and we win, versus Pocket Jacks. Seems like a cooler to me, just glad it went in the right direction this time. A few minutes later, this fun little hand comes up, where it folds to the big blind, he limps in before I look down at 10-6 suited in the $50 straddle. I'm happy to raise a lot of suited hands in position versus the limper. 10-6 is going to be one of those hands, so I make a 200 and he calls again. Flop is decent, ace 8-4 with a couple of diamonds. He checks, I bet 150, he calls. Turn is the jack of spades, he checks again. Eh, I could probably find some better hands to bluff here with, so I just check it back. River is the seven of diamonds, bringing in the flush. I'm expecting this to check through again and we'll just lose to a pair. But then my opponent bets out 375. Hmm, something doesn't feel right to me here. If he had a flush draw, wouldn't he check raise on the flop? And if he had a decent hand like top pair, for example, why would he bet when the flush comes in? I don't know, something about this play just felt weird. Of course, raising with 10 high seems rather ambitious, but then again, I'm an ambitious dude, you know? So I decided to make it 1175. Not exactly recommended, but like I said, spider senses were going off for a few different reasons. And in this case, it works out as he ends up folding. Kind of a weird hand, not even sure I like it that much, honestly, but a win is a win. Moving along to the last hand of the night in which we look down at pocket queens one last time, once again in the straddle. This time action folds to the small blind who makes it 225 to go. Big blind folds. I raise it up to 675 and the small blind calls. Two of us go into a flop which comes down queen nine six with two hearts. He checks. I've got three matching cards so I bet 400 and he makes the call. Turn card is a little embarrassing but uh, yeah, the queen of spades. I know, I'm running hot. I'm sorry. Anyway, now I've got four matching cards so I bet again, this time $600. Unfortunately, my opponent makes the wise fold. And even though we didn't get a ton of action with the four queens, it felt wrong not to include them. Anyway, shortly after this hand, it was around 2 a.m. and the game ended up breaking. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the hands. Well, that was a lot of fun, to say the least. It feels good to play a big game and finally win, and a decent win at that. I was in for 14.7K, kind of an odd number, but it was just all the cash that I brought on me. To be honest, I didn't really expect to play 10, 25, 50, so not a lot in the supply, but luckily didn't need much more. Ended up cashing out for $23,333 for a grand total of around 8.6K. One of the biggest wins I've ever had. And uh, what else is there to say? I ran really good. I thought I played well today. Not something that I think too often. And luckily there weren't too many tough spots, which is always nice. And usually when poker goes like that and you're playing some decent stakes, you're gonna win a bunch of money. And that's what happened tonight. This was a pretty long video, so if you watched all the way to the end, I really appreciate it for all you guys who have shown support through the ups and downs lately. Just know I appreciate you. And if you gave this video a thumbs up, that means a lot. It helps the channel continue to grow and you know, it's a nice little give back for the hours it takes to edit these. Hope you guys enjoy them. Plenty more to come. Not sure what's next. Maybe we will go back to this building back here, the Bellagio, and perhaps find an even bigger game. I'm starving, you know? That's what happens when you play like 12 hours, so I'm gonna go get some food. See you guys. <laughs>